everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Siphon Filter and Friends. I'm Tony from Hack the Movies, and today I'm joined by my best friend, Richard Ham. Richard, how are you? Hey, Tony! You're my best friend! I, you're my best friend. You're my hero and my idol. <laughs> Uh, so Richard, <laughs> and the uh, sad thing is, that's actually true at this point. I think you've yeah. gone so far down this rabbit hole. <laughs> there's no sunlight for you anymore. Yeah. So Richard, uh, why don't you tell people who you are and why you're on the last episode of Siphon Filter and Friends? Well, uh, well, one, because I am Tony's best friend, yeah. and of course Tony saved the best for last. And of two, course. I was the lead designer on Siphon Filter about a million years ago. Yeah. So I figure, who, who's more perfect to join me? than the guy who actually worked on this game. Uh, so we are here at the end of our journey. Yes. And uh, hopefully- And what a journey it has been. Yeah, peek behind the curtain. I still haven't filmed the three or two episodes leading up to this. So I hope this comes out on time. Oh, really? Oh, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you skipped all the cave stuff and you just came straight to me? Oh uh, yeah, I've, I've been filming out of order since the beginning of the show. They release in order. Uh, so oh my god, that ruins everything! The magic is gone! So I'm assuming everything went well. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we are finally at the missile silo, and uh, Richard, since you know more about this game than I do, do you want to <laughs> tell people what's going on in the story and what we're about to do? Well, long story short, our hero, Gabe Logan, has finally reached his final goal, chasing down international terrorist roamer all over the world, going on a myriad of exciting adventures, and it all comes down to this. There is a missile about to be launched. It is chock full of the siphon filter, which is a programmable virus, and these days is a little bit more prophetic than we perhaps thought all the way back in the 90s when we originally made this game. It is up to Gabe to literally save the world from um, Romer's mad plan to launch this missile. And he's running out of time. Yes. Uh, I said in the previous episode that I either picked the best or worst time to start this show, uh, depending yeah. on how you look at it. Uh, yeah, so let's start uh, the very last uh, level here, Missile Silo. Yes, you were right. The Deviaka's launch sequence. Was that a real name of a missile or did you guys pull that out? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, I mean, you know, this was way back in the 90s. It was much tougher to do research about this stuff, but we did try. I okay. guarantee you, Devyatka is a uh, is a Soviet-era uh, Kazakhstan uh, a missile yeah. you could find in under a warehouse in some random Kazakhstani <laughs> town. I guarantee. We actually went there. We took pictures. No. <laughs> but we did actually do as much research as we could pre-Wikipedia. Yeah. And, of course, since this was the 90s, we have to go to the command computer mainframe room. Because that was very... You know what? That's still a thing in video games today. Like the new Spider-Man game. You have to go to like the mainframe computer room and it's got a big label on it. And I'm like, wow, that never really went away. Of course, yes. Yeah. We, we were ahead of our time. Yeah. Okay, there's that missile. Yep, it doesn't look good. By, by the way, this is the most stressful episode because I have to play like your game. You have to watch me. And, and I made it very clear I'm not good at video games. And this is like, the, the creators watch me, and you're gonna be like so horrified by how bad I am. <laughs> so I apologize. Convinced every step of the way. Ever since YouTube <laughs> randomly recommended this to me one afternoon, I'm like, oh, Cypher so and Friends, yeah. that's a new twist. And I'm Tony's yeah, best yeah, friend, yeah. I so, should clearly watch this. So yeah, so it just randomly recommended it to you? I mean, I assume it gets recommended, yeah, yeah, you've yeah. talked about the game before. Yeah, um, I forgot that I played the level before this in save, so I actually have good weapons. Usually when I play this, I have to use the level skip, and the level, the level skip has to, like, it usually, like, you know, it starts you with, like, the weakest bullet, <laughs> like, the weakest weapons. Uh, yes. So I didn't want yeah, this yeah. episode to be 10 hours long, so I made sure to go ahead of time <laughs> and get all the good weapons from the previous level. Ugh, yeah. Okay. And these henchmen are really smart. They're just firing in front of the... By the way, I want to call bullshit. Why are they allowed to shoot the rocket with no consequences? But if I shoot the rocket, it goes off. And uh, what's it called? Leon yells at me. What's that all about? <laughs> they, uh, they've got rubber bullets. Oh my god. Damn it! Now, did you forget this was yep. gonna happen? No, 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 I, I remembered. I was just about to say it. I just thought, because I'm playing with the oh. volume down because of audio. And for some reason, this level doesn't have a timer that lets you know 
This one doesn't. You just have to go by like the audio. And like when yep. and she's speaking in Russian, so when I was a kid, I didn't know what she was saying. I didn't know I was being tied. <laughs> but again, that's not a problem because the game's the, the the game's perfect. Uh, I'm sure that was an intentional thing. It enhances the immersion. <laughs> Gabe would not have a little clock exactly. in his, you know, Ga- in, you know, in his peripheral vision. You're right, Gabe. Gabe would not. He would not. He does. He speak Russian. I forget. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Do we just need to shut up for a little bit? Fortunately, folks, this is a really short level. Uh, the the the, the enemies are a little harder, but it is a short level. Oh wait, I forgot. I oh, please tell me. Oh good. This this gun just rips through bullets. I mean, bulletproof vests or flak jackets. <laughs> or, uh, flak jackets, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it. I've been watching all the way through. You can kill anybody with a flak jacket with any gun. You just got to pump, pump enough lead into them. Yeah, this gun specifically, like, tears through it, though. Climb, climb, you fool. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I'm climbing, I'm climbing. I don't know if she started talking. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Don't fall off. Okay. Don't fall off. Oh, thank God. <laughs> So what was the, uh, oh, so, all right. okay. All right. Now I have a very important question to ask you here after this little cut yes. scene with Markinson, uh-huh. who's a traitor, apparently. Markinson. Markinson. Of course I knew you would solve the puzzle eventually. I expect only the best from my man. Where is Romer? You're asking me? How long has Romer been working for you, Markinson? Since your mission to Costa Rica. When you discovered the connection between Romer's plantation at Fagan, I did some digging of my own through our monitor at the WHO. And decided that you wanted the virus for yourself. For the agency, actually. And the missile? The missile was my idea. Markinson came here to stop it, but he was too late, as are you. Who's the target, Romer? Does it matter? And by the way, that is the okay. best line in all of Siphon Filter playing right there. I- oh, wait, 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 I gotta ask you a question. So the second episode, D- Dick Masterson, he he pointed this out. It's really a bad virus. Yeah, it's one where you can target like certain demographics. Certain races. Yeah. I remember, and they don't say what race they're targeting No, no, either. they never say which one. <laughs> so it kind of, so it's it just, makes you the bad guy as well. When yeah. You're imagining what this could be yeah. used for. So we have to decide, and then it's like, oh my God, if I pick any group, I'm a racist. So please tell me who is Eric Romer targeting? I need to know. <laughs> I remember John and I sitting down and talking about this. We, we were kind of in the same conundrum you were. I mean, what are we going to do? It was always a MacGuffin for us. It was just, well, this sounds really bad. And we realized, well, gosh, who, are we, who could we possibly say? And then John just, what if we say it doesn't matter? Is why it is the greatest line in all of Siphon Filter history. No, that's what I assumed. That's what I always assumed. It was just supposed to be ambiguous. But then Dick put that idea in my head where it's like, now you have to decide. And whatever you decide, you're a horrible person. And I'm like, oh no. (laughs) Anyway, let's try to outrun this explosion here. Go! To the Uh, blast doors! The blast doors! Oh Oh, dear! Uh, So I left my uh, like PlayStation and the physical copy at the office and I'm not allowed at the office right now. So I have to use the mini. And I'm just not used to using the the D-pad with this. I'm gonna get this, don't worry. I've beaten this level okay, many, many, many. As soon as you come back up, hold that strafe. Be strafing right. So strafe right, strafe right. You're yeah. right, you're right. This I'm remembering good, yeah. this now. Strafe right from the get-go. There you go, there you go. And now be rotating as you're strafing. There you go, yes, baby. I got like uh, really sick a few months back and I was just practicing like every level on repeat. Uh, so if I would have recorded this like a month ago, I would have been perfect. But now I'm out of practice. So I'm screwing worry, up I'm here all for over you. again. Thank you. I'm here for you. Thank you. you. My best friend is here for me. (laughs) (laughs) Finally, all your fair weather friends are gone. Yeah. Including the ones you've yet to film with, but we won't talk about them. (laughs) And by the way, way, now we put the timer on the screen. Uh, yes. Because for folks who are wondering, <laughs> it's too late. The missile's already been launched, but it's not yes. too late to cause it to self-destruct. Can Gabe trigger the self-destruct in time? Yeah, that is very intense. Yeah. By the way, I want to thank you for uh, I won't I don't know if it's you whoever decided to make the uh, cutscenes not intrusive and very brief and short. <laughs> and to the point, like that's the thing. Like I when I bring up like cuts, like I don't hate cutscenes and stuff. Um. Oh god. But there are some it, games there are some games that go a little too nuts with it. And this is like the one game I can think of where every cutscene has a purpose. 
Yeah. Like it's to set up the level or like, you know, set up the next level or give you like another objective. I don't think there's a cutscene in here that's like a waste of time or someone just pretending that they're doing a movie. So I, I really yeah. appreciate the cutscenes. Well, we, as it turned out, we were the antithesis to Metal Gear Solid in many, many ways. <laughs> and cutscene length is definitely one of them. I did it. Leon, I made it. I'm triggering the missile's detonator now. NATO spy sats are tracking it. There it goes. Thank God, Gabe, you've done it. <sighs> I'm downloading the virus information now. I'm ready for pickup. Don't you know when to quit, Logan? We'd have made a great team. I don't think so. This boss fight it goes from being the hardest boss fight ever until you find out what you have to do, and then it quickly becomes really easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting to see if you're going to go the uh, dramatic way or the anticlimactic way. So, Romer's got the hardest weapon in the game. Um, yep. Grenade and launcher. as far the as I can tell, there's I no... Yeah, there's no other way to kill him, right? That is... It's a, right, the cheapest, uh, crappiest boss fight yes. ever. Are you going to get him just like this? No, no I got him! <laughs> yep, you got him. And I That's love this death scene. This is one of my favorite death scenes. Me and my friend used to reenact this oh, all yeah. the time. The, oh, oh, no, again. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and his hands don't quite touch the ground, so rigor mortis just kicks in. Here's the thing. I mean, you can look at these credits. Watch these credits. These are going to be the shortest credits you have ever seen for any modern AAA video game. We were the tiniest, pluckiest little crew imaginable, and we just wanted to do something else. With the benefit of hindsight, maybe we should have just brought Gurdu's flamethrower back, because that turned out to work out really well. And I and I love the idea of it being a cat and mouse game where... He could be anywhere, and you're afraid of him, and you're and he's hunting you, and you've got to hunt him. And for some reason, it just didn't occur to us, or you could just wait up there in the catwalk and just hit him with a grenade, and that was that. But surely, the first time, the first time you played it, that did not occur to you. He probably scared the crap out of you as a little kid. I had no idea how to beat him. I had to have a friend come oh. over and show me what to do. Because um, I had no idea. I was oh, like, what am I doing wrong? I'm shooting... <laughs> Yeah, I'm shooting him in the head, which is not armored, by the way. I want to point that out. Uh, he has no armor on his head, <laughs> unless his beret is made yeah. out of adamantium or something. Yes. Um, so I'm shooting him like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and my friend's like, oh, yeah, you need the gas well, grenades. I apologize. I'm like, oh, uh, we're going to let these credits play because there's a little uh, behind the scenes stuff. I mean, not behind the scenes. Uh, there's like a post credit sequence. Here we go. And Amara coming back. <clears throat> Who's yep. never a redhead again? Mara, not really this. dressed for our modern times, I'm afraid. Yeah, she's wearing what she wore to the uh, the Farcom yeah, gallery. Yeah. Like, does she? <laughs> but yeah, that's very X Files. Dun, 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 cliffhanger. Yeah. So, Richard, <clears throat> I have yes. to ask, where did the idea uh, for this game come from? the The idea for this game is crazy. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal: Idetic. Uh, which is now Sony Bend. Yeah. You know, they and still a lot of people are still there and they just did, you know, Days Gone. Yeah. And, you know, we had just finished Bubsy 3D. And uh, the publisher, Accolade, just completely dropped us and wanted nothing more to do with us. That was a real problem time. <laughs> and um, Sony, they see that, yeah, well, Bubsy didn't go well, but they were impressed with what we did technically with the PlayStation. Because we, at the time, we were only the game that ran in high res. And high res at that point was like, mm -hmm. you know, 480p. That's one of the big problems with Bubsy. But anyway, they were impressed by that. And we've got an idea for this game called Siphon Filter. And we're like, okay, we'll take anything. We are desperate. Okay. And here was the original pitch that was developed internally. The power of the earth is basically manifested in what were called siphons. These kind of ethereal Gaia things things and there were certain members of humanity there were certain people who could filter the siphons to turn this raw planet energy into basically what allowed humanity to survive and you were one of the siphon filters okay that was gonna be my next question is where did the name siphon filter come from <laughs> um yeah i guess they had had this idea internally for a while and we we're like Ugh, yeah. Okay, we'll do anything because we are desperate for work after Bubsy 3D, but yeesh. And very quickly, it changed from that. Or heck, maybe it had already changed internally. Because I remember, still, from Sony, the next iteration of the pitch was kind of more like 
Tech War. If you remember the old William Shatner series of books, and I think it actually had a TV show. Uh, yes, because William Shatner got into a fight with Jerry the King Lawler on an episode of WWF, uh, and he promoted Tech War during it. Because Jerry the King was insulting the crowd, and William Shatner went, how dare you insult these people? They're our viewers. They're the people who watch Tech War. And then he beat up Jerry the King Lar. Anyway, I didn't really watch it, but I know of it. Um, well, anyway, they had already kind of reshaped it to be, hey, how about we set it in the year 2050, and it's just like, you know, future tech, all, you know, kind of Blade Runner-y and stuff like that. At the time, I was a huge fan of John Woo-style, um, you know, Hong Kong gun stuff. I loved those movies, and I had the dream for a game that captured that feeling. And that kind of became what we pushed for internally, saying, well, hey, how about that whole assassin thing? But let's set it today in the modern day. Nothing was said in the modern day. We had a lot of pushback. Well, could you at least have a level on the moon or on a space station? Or maybe vampires could show up? And we're like, no, 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 no. Because Ultimately, I, we wanted that kind of action. I was really, really keen uh, at the time on a movie called Assassin, starring Antonio Banderas and is it Sylvester Stallone? And it was actually written by the Wachowski brothers who would go on to write and direct The Matrix. Let's make something set today. Let's have you be an assassin. And eventually Sony's final stipulation, and I guess it was a good one, is nobody wants to be an assassin. That would be crazy. Nobody wants to be a bad guy. So turn them into a, a secret government agent and we've got it. Yeah, yeah, so no one would ever want to play like an assassin or a hitman. There's never going to be a game about a hitman where you play a hitman that'll spawn many sequels about nope, hitmen. No, 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 yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a dead idea to this day. Our executive producer on the project, Connie Booth, turns out she had always wanted to be a secret agent herself. Um, and, and she was amazing, mm. she was incredible, but this was always kind of her... I ultimately got to do it. So, and we were happy. I mean, we're ha obviously, it worked out great. Just backtracking, when you said you wanted to take place in like the modern day, I think that's what I really liked about it. Because unless there was a game based on a movie that took place in the modern day, I'm off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of a lot of like action <clears throat> games that were taking place yeah. like, you know, in like realistic settings. Like Grand Theft Auto a little bit, but the graphics weren't good until like three. I mean, Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2 is fine, but, like, 3 is when it started, you know, the third-person thing. Um, yeah, and, and if anybody at the time had said, well, hey, Grand Theft Auto games, that's the future of the industry, mm -hmm. you would have been laughed out of the room back then in the 90s. Yeah, and no, that was a really smart decision, because a lot of, like, you said it, like, it feels like an action movie that would come out around that time. Like, I really like The Matrix, I like the Die Hard movies, they were all taking place in the present. And I don't know, this movie felt, I mean, this game felt like it could be a movie and i know i said it's like a movie a million times sarcastically throughout the show during all the cutscenes, but no it really did like at the time as a kid i'm like this feels like i'm watching like a movie that i really like uh on that topic i think it was doug lyman director who had just directed go and yeah. doug lyman's follow-up to go was originally going to be siphon filter the tv show I, that would have been amazing we were so excited i actually saw uh, we actually got to read the uh, spec script for the pilot, and I don't oh remember much God. about it other than, yeah, the the at the end, so for some reason, Gabe was in a big action scene and he was in the back of a of a of an ambulance and he was fighting with somebody and he had to use you know the defibrillator paddles to knock them out of the back of the of the ambulance and that was like oh and at one point he you know there was this line about he was such an amazing sniper that he. Um, he literally shot the wings off of a mosquito that was carrying the siphon filter virus at one point <laughs> in, the, in the spec script. Doug Lyman eventually did. I'm looking at IMDb now. He did The Born Identity, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, yeah. He did jump. So you can see, yeah. he wanted to do this. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And siphon filter was a monster hit. Yeah. Um, you know, surprised everybody. Yes. And so, yeah, Sony started pushing around. Sony uh, wanted to, well, hey, we've got this whole movie studio here, and we yeah. let's get actual actors and directors and creative people. And, yeah, as far as I know, it went quite a ways. And yeah. then I couldn't tell you why it fell apart. But, you know what, nine times out of ten, these things fall apart. Yeah, so, no, no. Uh, by the way, kudos to them for wanting to do a TV show instead of trying to ram everything into a movie. Because mm. um, I feel like that's a mistake with a lot of like uh, games turned movies. They want to like shove everything in. Um, but yeah, so next, next question. This might be right. the most important question. Uh, I'm ready. How did the idea for the air taser come about? <laughs> 
that was there, there was no one day that that happened it was kind of an iterative process i don't have a funny story for it but the reality is again it was a different time it was really common at that time that every game even if it was realistic, you always had a gun with infinite ammo. Yeah. So that if you ran out of other ammo, hey, we'll always just pull out this pistol. I mean, that was the Doom method. Yeah. And I thought that was so stupid because to <laughs> me, it was so important to be realistic. Yes. Well, you know, you know, uh, John Woo realistic, and you run out of bullets. Yeah. And so we had a problem. What happens if you run out of bullets? You're dead. You're, you're, you're totally screwed. And so for the longest time, we tried to get a knife to work. Oh. And that knife ultimately made it into Siphon Filter yeah. 2. Yeah, yeah. You know, that weird, you know, where you just, like, jab it into their necks oh, in the I most that. grotesque I, way possible. I love the knife. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and we just actually, we ultimately used the motion capture from one and put it into two. But we just couldn't make it work. The action was too fast. The bad guys were too far away. Mm. And um, so... And I thought, well, what else, what weapon could we have that's ranged that we could somehow justify as being infinite ammo? And I thought a taser. Okay. Yeah. At the time, I didn't really know anything about tasers. <laughs> and I couldn't look it up. Here's a trivia, another trivia bit. Yeah. All of the weapons, all of the weapon stats. I, at the time we made Siphon Filter, I had never fired a gun in my life. <laughs> and um, so all my research was in old um, GURPS, uh, you know, generic universal role playing system, an old GURPS uh, <laughs> manual about real world weaponry. And I just poured over that okay. and, um, you know, just took all, all the guns that sounded the coolest, that had the most variety. Hey, we want to have the, you know, the bottomless gun. We want to have the, you know, armor piercing gun. We yeah. want to have the rifle. And so that's where all the stuff came from. And another thing, um, I knew so little about how guns worked as the lead designer on this project. Yeah. Uh, most people don't realize this. The longer you shoot, the better your aim gets. Yeah. Which, of course, is backwards. Um, you know, and <laughs> Rainbow Six and Call of Duty ultimately taught me, nope, that's actually wrong. And then I eventually, some years later, I fired a gun. Yeah. And I realized, oh, yeah, the more you shoot, the worse it's going to get. <laughs> but ultimately, I didn't mind because, to me, it was all about trying to encourage players to just throw as much lead as possible, as fast as possible. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I ever did another siphon filter, I'd almost want to keep that in, even though it's completely unrealistic because you are encouraged and incentivized and rewarded mm -hmm. for just blowing through your ammo as fast as possible. <laughs> and then that's supposed to create a problem that, oh, crap, now I need more ammo. Well, let's go to the taser. So anyway, back to the taser. Yeah. We figured, okay, a taser will work. And right off the bat, it worked you know, it would, the line went out, it would grab on somebody, and you'd have to hold it for a little bit. But our first problem with that was, um, well, okay, it's uh, it's really, really far away. I mean, can, what, what's happening? And, you, know, we, you know, we can't really make out what's going on. And so we figured, okay, well, let's uh, let's have them start to, you know, you know we, we had bullet effects, ricochet effects. Let's just have them smoke. Yeah. Because sometimes it, you could be like 20, 30, 40, 100 feet away. Mm -hmm. They're so far. Let's just have a little bit of smoke come out. And we're like, okay, okay. Um, but yeah, but how do we know how long we have to hit it? You know, how long, you know, because we, we wanted it to be a dangerous thing. Yes. If you use the, the, the taser, you're standing still. Mm -hmm. You can get shot in the back of the head. So you have to take that risk. And we figured, okay, well, we've got the smoke. We know it's working. How about if we change it to fire? We, we literally set them on fire, and that's how you know you can let go, because they're dead. Because if you let go too soon, yeah. they're fine, and they'll just keep shooting at you. And we're like, okay, okay, that works. And then... I'm assuming it was Tom Plunkett, who was um, one of the war uh, wacky programmers we yes. had. I bet you anything, one day he said, Yo, what's it look like way over there while this guy is on fire? Oh. And, uh, and, and he just, well, let's just put a camera over there and see what it looks like. And we're all like, oh, this is it. This is the game right here. <laughs> um, so it was just, it went through a few iterations and it just kind of evolved that way. I don't, nobody ever had the idea, hey, let's come up with a taser that sets people on fire and has cinematic cutscenes to show them ragging and, you know, writhing in agony as they burn to death. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that never made it directly into a design document for Siphon Filter. Nice. Um, so I guess next question. Yes. Is, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, uh, I could have thought of a better question. It's like, what was it like designing the levels? Uh, but yeah, sure, <laughs> I'll do it. What was it like designing the levels? Let me tell you, Tony. It was a, <laughs> it was a really fun time. It's, um, it was interesting. I mean, uh, what was our process? Right, you know, every level was different, obviously. I mean, you mm -hmm. just played through the whole thing. You know as well as anybody. I mean, there's so much yeah. variety in the different types of levels. Which uh, I enjoyed. The, I was the lead designer on it. Um, Jeff Ross, I hired him. He came in about halfway through production because I couldn't do it all myself anymore. It was the yeah. first time in my life I ever had to delegate, and that was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And Jeff is still there at Sony Bend to this day and just finished Days Gone, and good on him. Uh, he made mm -hmm. good, that kid. But um, so he ended up, like, he did the museum, and he did some of the warehouse stuff at the end. I did some of the warehouse stuff. Okay. And 
he actually knew his way around 3D editors because I actually hired him. He was the lead on an old Quake mod called SWAT Quake, okay. which he had made himself with just, you know, he had rounded up people around the world, and this was long before people did this. Somehow mm -hmm. he made connections with people all over the place and got them to make a very cool mod for SWAT, for, for uh, Quake, that turned it into a modern day shooter. And I thought, okay, we just got to get this guy. If I'm going to get anybody, let's get this guy in. Yeah. So he came in, and his process was he actually worked out the levels in 3D and then worked with whatever artist was assigned with that level to, you know, to make it work, to put in lots of little, you, I'm sure you notice the number of times you have to take 90 degree turns left. And and write so that yep. we can unload the previous room and load the new room into memory as you're just running around because yes. the restrictions were so limited. Mm. Um, me, I did it old fashioned. I was working on paper. Um, and so the, the artists who worked with me probably had a little bit more leeway to just do whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And surely the biggest example of that is the church level. The church yes. level was unique because um, John Garvin, who it was the lead artist, he was, you know, I was the lead designer, he was the lead artist. We were kind of co-creative leads on the game. Mm -hmm. He had spent his college years in, um, in, in England and Prague and all that. And he had been to these massive churches, uh, you know, the or monasteries, um, you know, yeah. uh, the Duomo and stuff like that. And he had a very clear idea of what would be very, very cool. I had never been out of the United States. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I just kept coming up with his design for, oh, it's you know like a little church on top of a hill and there's a graveyard. And it's like, no, he didn't get it. So he completely designed that one himself. And it's yeah. clearly, arguably, the most brilliant, best use of 3D in the entire game. So good on him for that. And then that one was just, I think... I think I took the, yeah, I think Jeff did the underground stuff, I did the above ground stuff, and that was just, hey, we've just got this big playground, let's just figure out where to put bad guys and attack. Yeah. Um, the other thing about the job is, for, for Jeff and I, um, I did have to learn enough 3D Studio, this was before 3D Studio Max, to be mm -hmm. able to populate the paths for the bad guys. Because here's the thing, one of my number one things was I want you to feel like you're constantly under threat. There's bad guys coming from every direction. And, because at the time, Doom on the PC, that was the feeling. There's always tons of caco demons and mm -hmm. imps, everything, all the time. But then Quake came out and went to 3D. It's like, hey, you can fight two guys at a time and that's it. And I'm like, no. We have to no. fight in 10, 20 guys because that's the way it works in John Woo cinema. And yeah. the, the hard limit was there are never more than fab, five bad guys active. And that's why you're always getting guys, hey, I'm running down and suddenly, oh, there's people from behind you attacking because... Yeah. Um, yeah, we could we, we you know we could only have a, a few of them active at a time, and and they couldn't all be on screen at the same time either. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we did to ensure that we could actually have five enemies who would do interesting things and not just stand there. Sure, they stand there a lot, but you know they they will run around and they'll do rolls, and it looks like they try to hide behind things. Every single. Um, thing you ever see an NPC done was hand programmed by me in 3D or and Jeff, basically putting series of dots that became trails that they would walk on. And if we wanted ah. an NPC when he's moving along this path to roll, we would flag this dot or this vertice and this vertice and say, "Hey, roll between these." And he would do a roll. The enemies do not collide with anything. They have no concept of the existence of the world. All oh. they know is there are these invisible spaghetti strings all over the place that they are following. And you know, the, the, in the first level, the guys in the subway who you know come over the fence and they they jump down. Yeah. That's because I made a spaghetti string for them and said, "Hey, <laughs> when you get to this vertex, from this vertex to this vertex, put yourself in the falling animation." And then um, when you get to this one, write yourself and then keep running. So it was insane. Um, you know, each one of these levels was covered with thousands and thousands of these spaghetti strings dro driven all over the place that the NPCs could use. And we would have to manually touch every single one of them to get them to, hey, um, you're like, uh, if we come in the area, we want him to feel like they're sneaking. Let's have him like kind of crouch into view so you can see him. Well, that's because I said from here to here, you must always crouch, whether you like it that's or not. That's insane. I never even thought of it. now. It's making sense now. Yeah, because they don't usually like follow you certain areas. Yep, because they can't. Yeah, because they've yeah. reached the end of their string, and that's in part so that we can sure. Okay, well, if you don't kill them and leave them behind, once you go around the corner, there's no more danger of them following you, and we can turn on new guys for this new area. Because oh, okay. we just had these incredible technical restrictions. Yeah. No, that's smart. Yeah, that was that's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So All my right. next question is uh what is your favorite level out of the entire game? <sighs> I know oh. it's a hard one. That is a hard one. 
I mean, especially I'm incredibly since proud the of game, game is perfect and there's nothing yeah, wrong it with it. It is flawless. I mean, yes. how can you make me choose between my babies? <laughs> I Obviously. <know. laughs> I, I can definitely tell you my favorite one that Jeff did was the museum. I love everything about the museum. I love yeah. that big, crazy slide down the pyramid. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, you know, after the pyramid, you go through and you get into the aerospace area, and there, there's yeah. like a big early shuttle type thing, and you were supposed mm -hmm. to be able to shoot that down and have it crashing down. And that ended up getting cut. But then we had the explode. You want to know why we had the exploding chandeliers? Because it was originally yeah. supposed to be an exploding space shuttle that fell down in a different level. <laughs> so, you just, so, so you just swapped it out in chandelier. <laughs> yeah. They're that cool. Are they not yeah, cool? No, they're cool. I still think they're cool. But it was always like, why Why did the chandeliers explode? Like, do yep. they have gas Why in every them? Jackie Chan film, when he punches somebody, do they explode in a puff of, of powder and dust? That, that's because true. It's cool. Yeah, and that, that was the aesthetic I was going for everywhere. Yeah. Just crazy over-the-top stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I I thought Jeff did an amazing... And I just love the conceit of the museum that you're constantly, mm -hmm. oh, we're out in the actual place, but then we're behind the scenes. And yeah. then we're, we're crawling around in the thing. And then, you know, I always love that idea. But honestly, I, th I think the one I'm most proud of was the opening for the warehouse because I love this idea of, oh, it's a stealth level where there's a war going on all around you. Yeah, that and is really cool. if you're really careful, cool. you can avoid most of the combat and just let them kill each other. It doesn't mm -hmm. always work, but I thought that was very, very cool. And yeah. Um, yeah. No, I really like that. I think I think my favorite like section of the game uh, is the church stuff just because- uh, The church I is amazing. Yeah, so I, I went to, like, Catholic school growing up, so I spent a lot of time in, like, churches and whatnot. Yep. Nothing that looked like that, but I... So to see, like, this violent video game and, like, this religious thing, I was, it was just really cool to me for some reason. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure I let you work out some fantasies. Yeah, yeah. Like the so original commercial, which I know you remember. Yes, it's the only commercial that really grabbed me as a kid. I have no idea why. It's just really, it, it's it an stays insane with you. commercial. I mean, if anybody yeah. watching this hasn't seen it yet, I'm sure Tony will put a link somewhere because I, yeah. I know it's on YouTube. Yep. And there is no way that commercial would be made today because it yeah. was the whole point was hey, here's a person who's losing touch with reality. And because he's played this game so much, he's one step away from becoming a homicidal maniac in real life. Yeah. And yeah. that's or what Siphon maybe, Filter does to you. Or maybe he just wants to serve his country and fight for America. Did you there ever you think go. of it like that? You know what? I never talked to the agency let's say that's what the case was it was a, it was a, such a cool commercial we were blown away by it although this the commercial for siphon filter 2 was even better that was pretty great with the the, the bad guys like yeah. selecting what weapon yeah the that grenade launcher good. yeah the, the taser yeah the taser <laughs> yeah that, whoever did that they really got us that, that okay. was awesome uh this next question this is like a weird one that everyone i know who really likes this game uh, they all know about this weird glitch, or maybe it's intentional. Uh, so what is up with the weird glitch when you shoot out the lights in the T-Rex exhibit and then fall through the floor? What is that all about? Honestly, uh, you know, it, that, that is just a glitch. Uh, you know, that's certainly not something that was put in on purpose. The thing is, okay. um, like I said up front, our engine was able to do some stuff that nobody else was doing on the PlayStation at the time. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Vertex Lighting. Uh, Mark okay. Blank was like one of our technical programmers. And Mark Blank, by the way, is the creator of Zork, if you oh. want to go all the way back to the 70s. Okay. And so he was really proud of the, I, I think it was Mark's work that um, allowed us to dynamically change the lighting on a vertex by vertex variable so we could have dynamic lighting. Okay. And yeah, we use it every once in a while. Oh, there's sparks, and so the lights are turning on and off. You know yeah. all the blood that is appearing on people when you shoot them, yeah. which mostly you see on the lab coats, although it happens for everybody? Yeah. Those are actually red lights that are okay. shining on them, virtual lights that are shining red. Huh. Um, and so we were just looking for, what else can we do with this? Because it's so cool that we can do it. Mm. What if we make every single light in every single level real? <laughs> and if you shoot them out, you'll make the whole level go dark. Yeah. And I don't know why we thought that was good. I think yeah. at one point there was the idea that the uh, lights and the glass would kind of encode, have this kind of magnetic attraction. So that when mm -hmm. you're just shooting at stuff, the bullets would just tend to hit the lights and, you know, <laughs> and the same for glass. And I don't think that ever went in. So it's okay. kind of like this leftover idea, but um, it became a thing. We had to make sure every level, yeah. we, you know, every one of those had a light associated with it. They had to be associated with this destructible sprite that was put in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, 
and like I said, it was really, as, as I understand it, and I'm a caveman, a uh, very <laughs> heavy-duty code for the PlayStation to be able to deal with dynamic lights like that in real time. And um, and I think he did some kind of weird kung fu coding to make that happen. And okay. sometimes it'll make the world disappear. So and because make... of that, we shouldn't have been doing it. But we yeah. didn't know any better. Yeah. I don't even know how I found out about that. I think a lot of people like me are really in the game just love the destructible environment. Yeah. So well, that was like, a big deal for us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So like, I guess I tested it out one day. Let me just shoot all the lights because I'm like 11 and girls aren't well, talking to me yet. And this is how I spend my days. <laughs> and then I honestly, just fell through the floor. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're, it's, why are we doing this? Well, somebody <laughs> will enjoy it. Somebody will like shooting all the lights out. And so there was at least one. There. There. You got it. You got it from me. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, this one is like the biggest mystery that I okay. can't figure out. Do you know what happened to the voice actor who played Gabe? I can't find anything about that guy. Apparently, there's an MMA fighter with the same name, and some people think it's him, but I highly doubt no, that. No, no, no. No, I highly doubt that. Yeah, yeah John Chacon, such a good he voice. was... John Chacon was a disc jockey in San Francisco, I believe. Okay. You know, uh, I don't know if he was a morning shock jock or whatever. And he was a, he was working on becoming an actor, but he was he was a working disc jockey. Okay. And um, you know, he just there there were auditions, and he got the job because his voice was perfect. Yeah. Um, his acting wasn't necessarily, but his voice was perfect. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think I, after I left, yeah. I mean, because we used him on two. Yeah. And, I'm, and we used him on, th or they used him on three, because I only was there for a little bit of three. But yeah. I think when they went to Omega Strain, they ended up getting somebody else, and I couldn't tell you why. It's a, I'm sure, I'm sure he's still out there somewhere. Yeah, I just, and I'm I sure his voice. Any... If, if anything, his voice is probably even more amazing now that he's just, yeah, in his seventies. I, I can't find any credits for him or anything. I don't know if he's going by a different. Name. I don't know. You know but, what? Years ago, I know I did a search for him because somebody asked, and I found, yeah. um, I found his name. On an agency, you know, okay. like, you know, his agent saying, "Okay, here, here's all the actors I work with, and here's this guy," and because it, it listed, I was the voice of Gabe Logan, so he's out there somewhere. Oh shit! The I, truth is out there. If you can give me that info, I would love to hire that guy for something. Um, I've tried to mimic that voice so much when I was a kid, like the whole <laughs> "My God, siphon filter." I can never get it right. Uh, <laughs> but no, he's got such a great voice. I would have loved to hear him in like cartoons and stuff. And I just, oh, I know, I can't, yeah, I agree. I can't find anything for him, like. If I'll I see was, if I can find it and, and send you a follow up. Yeah, yeah. If I was making like a Batman cartoon, he's who I would hit up to be Batman. And I say that as I have a picture of Kevin Conroy and me over there. <gasps> How dare um, you? But you know, you got to switch it up once in a while. <laughs> I would love to get him. Um, say so yeah, now that we're on characters, uh, who's your favorite character in the three that you worked on? Um. Uh, oh, the three I worked on. Okay, so we're not just limited to the first. Well, well, I mean, we can limit it to the first, but I figured you well, had it's hard not to, in the others. You know, obviously, Gabe and, and Leon. Uh, yeah, you know, because I love them. And yeah. I here's the deal. Originally, we said, okay, we're going to do. We're, we're, it's going to be a uh, spy thing, right? Mm. And okay, we, 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 let's let's be careful not to copy. Um, what do you call it? Uh, J James Bond too uh, close. Yeah. And so here's the deal. I'm a I'm a blatant thief. Every yeah. game I've ever worked on, I've always just looked for inspiration from others, and I don't mind, you know, stealing yeah. from the best. Yeah. I mean, the gameplay of Siphon Filter is just basically me trying to fix what I didn't like in Goldeneye, and me mm -hmm. trying to fix what I didn't like in Tomb Raider, and combine okay. the two into something new. Um, okay. Which we can come back to that if you want. But, yeah. um, so, okay, we're not going to copy James Bond. I was, and to this day, am such a huge fan of True Lies, James yeah. Cameron. Yeah, and, that's a good one. Um, and I especially loved the uh, you know the relationship between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Tom Arnold, the guy in the van. Yeah. And so that was always that was a very early idea that we're gonna have a guy in the van. And for a while, he was a guy in a van, and mm -hmm. his name was literally Guy Vanoff, which uh, <laughs> which was not good. Um, it was it was a little too on the nose, I think. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, it's like anyway, Farcom. That's a little on the nose, but whatever. Yes. <laughs> but, hey, but you know. That could be that could be a company name that exists. I that's think. true. That's true. Especially in the '90s, because <laughs> calm was cool. What is what is yeah. calm? Okay, put that on everything, because um, never heard of it. But um, yeah, so we wanted to do that, and ultimately, when John came on uh, and he took over the story, and he was mm -hmm. a huge X Files fan, and that's where all the dark 
shadowy conspiracy stuff worked in. And okay. John ultimately um, turned Guy into a girl and said, hey, let's just do something really interesting, which was far out at the time. Mm. Well, let, let's let's not just have it be another white guy. Let's actually have it be a woman. And let's okay. have it be Asian. And you wouldn't know it, but John was always very ahead of the curve trying to include inclusivity. And this was back in the 90s when nobody was thinking about it. Yeah. Which is why you actually have, I mean, you, you've got you know, an, an Asian uh, woman is the co-hero of the story. You've yeah. got um, you know African-American characters. And ironically, it never meant to be this way, yeah. but somehow every African-American character, every black character we put in this game, through the amorphous um, you know, process of fixing the story and working on the story, ended yeah. up being bad. You know, they, we never started <laughs> out, but somehow they all turned out evil, and John was always so mortified by that. He never yeah. wanted it. Just, it was the natural evolution, but we already had the models, so we can't change them. Yeah. Um, when we turned Romer from a good guy into a bad guy, that, yeah. um, that's why Lawrence Mujari exists in that makes um, sense. Psyche yeah. Filter 2, specifically yeah. to say, look, Black people can be good. <laughs> Heroes too. We're so sorry, but you know, I always thought I, you know, it, it would never have occurred to me in a million years. Uh, no. But it was important to John to try to push for that, and that's what Leon was. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that's not what Mara Aramov is at all. <laughs> I, I look at those costumes now, and that is not very. Um, she is not very woke at all. L listen, <laughs> listen. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with it. It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> of course, it's flawless. I forgot. It's, Thank it's you flawless. for it's reminding flawless. me. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> no, it's funny. Actually, I just want to point out, I had no idea Roma was black. I just thought he had like a really bit like dark tan because he's from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad is like, I know he said they say he's like German, I think, in the manual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my dad yes. is like Southern Italian. He's got very dark skin, so I had no idea the, the, all these years. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, John, if you're seeing this. I'm sorry, I outed you, but John did make good. <laughs> Lawrence is a good character too. Lawrence is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing about Leon that's crazy. Yeah. Um, Freaking Metal Gear. Jeez, it's insane. Oh, oh, we wicked. felt like we had oh. industrial spies because <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't even know about the existence of Metal Gear until yeah. like what three months before it came out. It, it, it was got that huge jumbotron treatment at E3. Yeah. No game had ever done that before, I think. Yeah. And the whole industry just stopped and stared, and we just stopped and started crying because. <laughs> From our perspective, everything we were killing ourselves to do, they were just knocking out of the park. I mean, they had better yeah. presentation, more cinematic feel, um, you know, uh, yeah. you know, professional actors as opposed to disc jockeys, all of that. <laughs> but the craziest thing was they, um, you know, we had a big mid-game boss fight with a gigantic guy with a Gatling gun. They had a gigantic guy with a Gatling gun. Ugh. We had a boss fight with a helicopter. They had a boss fight with a helicopter. We had a plucky Asian sidekick yep. named, um, oh, what was her name originally? Uh, Mai Jing. Metal Gear had one named Mai Ling. Ugh. It's like, what? How is this happening? You had a spy. I've always said Kojima's a hack. He had a spy exactly, in your agency. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Yeah, um, you heard it from your word. Kojima I, I, I call is you a out, Kojima-san. <laughs> uh, publicly, finally, after all these years. Yeah. But no, it was just insane. And so, like, and we're like, okay, well, okay. Well, we, and it was a good thing. In some ways, it was a good thing. It made us change Gurdu into a flamethrower. Yeah. And 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 for Gurdu is awesome. The flamethrower is yeah. much cooler than the uh, the Gatling gun would have been. And the, and I'm pretty happy with the uh, with the helicopter. Although it's way too easy, I didn't realize how exploitable it is. Much like the final <laughs> boss fight with Romer, but it's okay. It yeah. was still cool and it, exciting. It's one of those like it's easy if you're an asshole like me who's played it six billion times. Exactly. The but first time anybody plays it, it's yeah. terrifying. Yeah, and you're just oh, running around. Yeah. You got nowhere to hide. Um, yeah. And so, but but all we could do with um, you know. Uh, my Jing, or my Jing, because there, theirs was my Ling, ours was my Jing. I don't remember exactly. People could look up. We said, okay, we'll change her name. We'll, yeah. cha we'll change her to Leon Jing instead of my Jing. Yeah. And you're like, okay, that's what we can do. <laughs> and um, so it was just so crazy. It was such an insane time that yeah. all that stuff happened. And what I like about Leon is because I'm a big James Bond guy, and my favorite James Bond movie is Tomorrow Never Dies, which had come out shortly before, like a few years before this game. And he had an Asian lady sidekick in that. Yeah. So yeah. that's just another thing. It just tapped into like my psyche. I'm like, I really love this. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was so happy in two that we actually made her a playable character. And Although you know, that we, level we, is really annoying. I'm, I'm going to point the, the, that. The, 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 uh, the, the Air Force base? The Air Base? 
Here's yeah. the problem with Siphon Filter 2. You know, yeah. Siphon Filter was a huge success. We did not expect it at all. Mm. Um, we thought we were dead. We thought yeah. we were just going to be forgotten in the end. We thought we were making another Bubsy. Because <laughs> Bubsy, we were like, okay, we're, we're pretty proud of what we're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's not perfect, but we've yeah. done some amazing things here. And then, like, a few months before Bubsy 3's come out, hey, here's Crash Bandicoot and Mario 64. Ugh. <laughs> and we're doomed. We're doomed. Because we were basically comparing ourselves to Jumping Jack Flash, if you yeah. remember that. Yeah. That was that was our high watermark. And then we thought, oh, this is it's history repeating itself. We've done everything we could, and now Metal Gear is going to come out and completely destroy us again. We're all going to be out of a job. Yeah. Um, but then it was a huge hit, and and I'm so happy about that. Um, you know, people did recognize that it was a very very different. Like you said, I mean, our approach yeah. to storytelling was very mm -hmm. different, and ultimately, I liked ours better. Um, yeah, yours, you think, yours made we were sense to the point. But one thing I was unhappy with on Siphon after it was all done is we had such dreams of cool, big, cinematic moments happening in real time. You know, mm -hmm. not being cutscenes. And we did a little bit of it, but every time we wanted to do anything, we had to go beg, borrow, and steal from programmers who did not have the time to write custom code for us. Yeah. So when we got to Siphon Filter 2, one of the big changes was, I mean, there's lots of things. We have a multiplayer mode and stuff. Yeah. One of our big changes was Mark Blank. He created a, a scripting language called Siphon Script, um, taught Jeff and I how to program in it, and Jeff and I were able to program anything we wanted. And we could make anything happen. We were no longer limited to just being able to specify, hey, from this vertex to this vertex, you'll crouch. We could make them do anything. Uh, all we could do in the original was make th change their behavior a little bit and specify when they spawn. You know, because you know full well. You play the game enough. Yeah. I must have walked through an invisible wall. Yes, you did. That's yep. what turned on the next guys and turned off the previous guys who couldn't follow you. You, I mean, you can see them transparent. spawn occasionally. There's yeah. some levels where if you get to a certain point quick enough, you'll see the enemy pop in. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, it's, it's not perfect. It is perfect. <laughs> it, is it is perfect. perfect. Thank wrong you. With it. You're, you're programming me. I appreciate that. So <laughs> we wanted to do more cool stuff like the movies, and we wanted to make you feel like we're in the middle of it. And so both Jeff and I were doing that, and it was great. The mm -hmm. Air Force Base was originally awesome. It was yeah. much more like um, the uh, the oh the Kazakhstan military. It was the military base in Kazakhstan, the snowy yeah, military yeah, base. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Hey, fight if you want or sneak if you want. It's up to you. I mean, that was mm -hmm. a really big success of the original Siphon that you were free to play however you wanted. Yeah. But but we had all these really cool set piece moments that mm -hmm. really stood out, and you know th those are really common these days. But at the time, it was kind of new. And here's yeah. the problem: they worked great until Sony's testing department got a hold of them. Yeah. And then they would say, "Oh well, we found a bug, and if you come over here, the whole thing falls apart." And okay, well, let's fix it so they don't go over there. Oh, okay. we found a bug. Then you know, if you kill this one before you kill that one, then you know the logic falls apart, and then they just stand around. Okay, well, let's just make sure you kill that one before you kill that one. Yeah. And over time, without even meaning to. The, the, they became super duper scripted and hey you got to see really cool cinematic moments but only yeah. if you did the exact right thing at the exact right time because we couldn't let you have that freedom anymore because it would lead to too many bugs Yeah, and yeah. that is easily I mean I ended up making video games for almost 20 years and that's probably one of the biggest mistakes one of the biggest learning moments for me ever mm -hmm. was Siphon Filter by accident um, just because we couldn't do any better has this kind of freedom that allows you to you know experience it the way you want to experience hey I don't want to fight all these guys I'm just gonna roll like crazy and try to avoid them yep. um, you know or I'm gonna I'm gonna stand in the corner and hide and take them out one by one or I'm just gonna run around like a crazy person target locking <laughs> you know it was up to you yeah. and we lost that in siphon filter 2 a little bit like the uh, yeah. the bridge you were having to sneak around on cool yep. idea but again overly scripted the and you're right the Air Force base is by far the worst example of that and that, that's that totally on me that's why I say I love Siphon Filter too, but the first one's more fun for me because it of is. that. It is. And you're right. And, and that's yeah. why. Yeah. Um, I, hey, I was still in my mid-20s. I was still learning how to <laughs> make video games. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, skip that one. All right. So have you played any of the sequels after three? <clears throat> I, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I did play some oh, uh, some of Mega Strain, which, okay. uh, by the way, everybody internally, the code name was just Mega Strain, is what everybody referred to it, I guess. Uh, okay. Because it was it was it killed them. Um, yeah. Because it was it, I mean it was so crazy ambitious that game. Yeah. Um, for the time and for the team, uh, so I played a little bit of it. But by that time, I was down in Texas working at Edge of Reality, mm. uh, working on Pitfall, The Lost Expedition. And, I mean, there were times when I didn't leave the building for four or five days in a row. So I just didn't have time. Uh, okay. And so I kind of missed it. 
Yeah. And years later, I did end up playing, I think, the first PSP game all the way through. I don't remember which one it was. And I remember thinking at the time, hey, this is really impressive. Although, again, my problem with the PSP games were they leaned too heavily into the, hey, let's have dual analog sticks and snap and peak, you know, the whole... Uh, yeah. Um, did Gears of, had Gears of War popularized that? No, Winback had already come out and popularized that snap and peak thing. Yeah. Nobody remembers Winback. That was an excellent <laughs> game on N64. Yeah. Um, and so I thought they were really well done. I mean, better than anything we ever did on the original PlayStation. Mm. But... They were too slow, and they lo they lost that kind of cinematic. You are Chow Yun Fat sliding down a banister, you know, you know, guns a blazing, everything blowing up, and if you stop moving, you will die. Mm. That was my number one thing. I wanted the action to feel like if you stop moving, you will die. No, um, you and watching you play, I was really happy to see. Yeah, you do keep moving, and you're rolling it because you know that's how you can stay alive is you're trying to get around the corner to get to safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've never... I tried Omega Strain. I still have it. I couldn't get into it. Uh, I might try, like, the single-player mode, because I doubt I can get multiplayer these days. Uh, but, um, yeah, Oh, I yeah, of course. I'm sure. Yeah, I couldn't really get... It just felt too different, whereas 3... I love 3, but I, I mentioned before that was a little too much of the same. And then Omega yep. Strain was, like, the opposite, where it was just way too jarring. Yep. Um, and then I w I'm not a big uh, mobile gamer, so I never had the PSP. I know they eventually ported them to PS2. Oh, did the they? P I didn't realize that. I think so, or at least oh, one of them. Oh, does that mean I could download it and play it on my PS3? Maybe. Oh, Because I know you can get Siphon Filter 1, 2, and 3 yeah. um, as, like, $3 downloads. That I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Look. Um, look it up. Uh, I know... Yeah. I'm pretty sure they ported them, or at least one of them, to PS2. So I might check out that. And yeah, I just, I never passed the third one. I couldn't really get into them. I feel like maybe that was just like a perfect trilogy. But I do like the characters, so I want to see. I know Gabe Logan dies, spoiler, but I want to know, like, how. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's insane. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's it's just the weirdest. Well, you, you don't have to play him. You can just go look it up on YouTube. <laughs> That's true. I could uh, just watch a Let's did. Play, really. Um but yeah, so so what was life like after Siphon Filter, and what are you up to these days? Okay, well, my <laughs> life or life in general, or life for the team, or uh, just, uh you, let's focus on you. <laughs> okay, it's yeah. all about me today. Yes, I am your best friend. You're my and we best haven't talked friend. forever. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, we're catching up after what twenty years? Yeah. This is great. <laughs> uh, since I was best friends with an eleven year old playing Siphon Filter, it was a little <laughs> creepy. Best not to dwell on that, I suppose. <laughs> Um, what? Uh, so, well, the thing is, after Siphon 2, which was also very, very successful, and we did a lot of amazing yeah. stuff, two discs, lots more um, cinematics, better look overall, although still the same ridiculous yeah. run cycle, um, which was, oh man, so embarrassing. But um, <laughs> originally, Siphon Filter 3, was going. we were intending to make it a launch title for PS PS2. Okay. And it was going to be called SFO, Siphon Filter Online. Because at that point, everybody in the office was super hardcore into Counter-Strike and what? I think Diablo 2 must have been out at that time. Okay. And I'm like, hey, well, you know what? On the original Siphon Filter, I mixed GoldenEye and Tomb Raider. Let's mix Counter-Strike and Diablo. That, okay. And put it in, and that would be amazing. You know, mm -hmm. the idea that you can get online and play with people, that the the worlds are kind of semi-randomly generated, so it just has infinite replayability, and um, there's this idea of leveling up your character, and we, you know, we had all these ideas. You, you have your home base, and you can level that up. You can level yourself up. Mm -hmm. You go on missions with other people. It was very, very ambitious. And, you know, we were working on it. We, we had a lot of prototypes. Uh, we um, Somebody actually went out to Japan and took lots of... For the first time ever, we actually took real pictures oh. of... Uh, because that was good. that was our test bed, was uh, Japanese streets, kind of like the Russian streets in Sign Filter 2. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, we were a few months in, and Sony came to us and said, Hey, you know what? PS2, it's going to be a big seller, but all those PlayStation 1s, they're still going to be out there. And we kind of don't have anything else big. Would you mind... Taking uh, all your ideas and just squeezing them into a PlayStation 1 title. <laughs> and that's why Siphon Filter 3 is so weird. Yeah. And you know, that's why it's the equivalent of a TV clip show. Where it's all yeah. flashbacks with the conceit of a courtroom drama that ties everything together. It's because we had all these ideas that Ooh. were going to take place in Siphon Filter Online. And we'd done the original work. And okay, well, we'll just try and squeeze it down into something so we can get it done. And... I understood, but I was to the point where, okay, I just can't do, I can't keep doing Siphon Filter for the rest of my life. I have to do something else. And that's when yeah. I decided to go. Um, you know, I did help a little bit 
um, you know, I, I think I did all the scripting for the the the, all, um, the the randomly generated mini missions that are in Siphon Three. That yeah. was my attempt. Hey, look, it's gonna be like Diablo. Okay, we don't have randomly generated worlds, but we can at least have randomly generated missions. That was kind of trying to get back into the spontaneity of the original. Yeah. But and you know, I needed a few things. But ultimately, at that point, you know, Jeff took over as lead designer on that, and mm. I decided I got to go do something else. Okay. I came this close to working on uh, the Matrix with Shiny. Oh. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, they flew me down and I had an all day interview with them. And at one point they all went to lunch and said, hey, we've told you a little bit about, or no, no, we already knew what the Matrix was. We everybody seen the Matrix. Yeah. And, and they were working on it. And we, you, okay, we, you know what we're doing here, design a level for us. I'm like, okay. And <laughs> so I did. And I swear that level is in the final game. It is. <laughs> yeah, it was the uh, it was the tunnels under. I mean, when I pr pitched it, it was tunnels underneath an airport, and okay. it was kind of that same idea as the museum that you're you're out in the main area, but then you're behind the scenes, and you're not in the main area, and they really yeah. liked it. And then they ultimately said, "Yeah, we'd love to hire you, but we'd have to hire you for Dave Perry's job, and we're not going to do that." Wow. And so, so it was too bad. I was I was overqualified, as it turned out. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and so I ultimately, and that's fine. So I went down to Texas, worked at Edge of Reality, was mm. there for five or six years, had a great time. And, you know, I definitely got to do a lot of things. I did a cute, cartoony, Metroid style, um, you know, adventure game, Pitfall. I did yeah. The Sims for console. Uh, oh. We worked on movie tie ins, Shark Tales, and some other stuff as well. And, and that was really, really great. But then by the time I hit my mid 30s, I decided, you know what? I need something else new. Um, and uh, we decided we wanted to live overseas, and that's when I got the job to go to Lionhead and ultimately became the lead designer on Fable 2, or the co-lead designer with, D with Dean Carter on Fable 2. Okay. And uh, that was good, although that was when I almost completely melted down because Peter Molyneux is a wonderful man. He's a kind, warm, generous, incredibly creative person, and he will drive you absolutely insane. <laughs> he is the most maddening person I have ever met in my life, and I love him. <laughs> but oh my god uh, for the first time in my life towards the end of fable 2 i was getting high blood pressure and <laughs> and ulcers and stuff like that and i'm okay for my health i can't stay here anymore and so that's when i jumped over to brink um mm. for splash damage which was really cool because i at that point i hadn't done a shooter for what 10 15 years yeah and i had a great time doing that and brink I am so sad. I'm so bummed that those guys who who interviewed me for Bubsy, they didn't interview me for Brink because I've got so much to say <laughs> about Brink. And I think yeah. I think I can finally openly talk about how Bethesda tried to run us into the ground, run us out of business so they could steal us or you know they ooh, could basically ooh. Oh man, I got so many freaking stories for Brink. Um but we'll save that for another day. Well, look, uh, I, I know a lot of gaming channels. I, I could probably point you in someone's direction if you want to get that You know what, quite frankly, I maybe should keep my uh, mouth shut. <laughs> I don't know how much reach Vlatko has. You know, I don't even know if Vlatko is still the head of Bethesda. But, I mean, that guy was a total... He's not, he wasn't a mobster, but he definitely employed yeah. Sopranos-esque methods in... <laughs> Brink was a very challenging game, and I'm still so proud of it. But, yeah. obviously, it crashed and burned hugely mm -hmm. um, for reasons I won't go into here although yeah. I can point many fingers um, <laughs> although I made many mistakes too I don't I don't mean I mean I made my share of mistakes I made my share yeah. of mistakes on every game I'm only human I'm always learning yeah. and then around the time Brink was uh, wrapping up my wife and I had a trip in France and we bought a copy of Pandemic which is a very popular board game Okay. And at that point, I didn't even know modern designer board games existed. And spoiler alert, you might notice I'm surrounded by modern designer board games. I saw I, those, yes. <laughs> I fell so hard in love with board games that they kind of ruined my love for video games. I've been playing video games since I was a little kid in the 70s when yeah. I first learned that I'm better at my dad at Pong. My dad is a <laughs> god, but I can beat him at Pong. I will play video games for the rest of my life. <laughs> and you know, and they, they defined me as a person growing up. And um, but board games killed video games for me. And mm -hmm. I realized I, I I just can't keep doing this anymore. And so I over the next few years kind of segued into where I am now. Now I do a YouTube channel about board games. Yeah. In my in my twilight years, because I turned fifty one this week. Oh, nice. Thank well, you. Have, well, by the time people see this, it would have passed. So. Exactly. Yes. So, so I turned fifty one a few weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> No, that's really cool. And uh, what's your YouTube channel? Say, tell people uh, your YouTube it's, channel. Uh, uh, YouTube.com slash Rado. R-A-H-D-O. Yeah. Raw for Richard Allen Ham. Doe because my Hobbit name is Rado because it rhymes with Frodo. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. I have only a few more questions left. 
Oh man, I could talk all day. So if you could bring back Siphon Filter these days, if given the op, how would you bring back Siphon Filter if you could? I totally days? know what I would do. This popped okay. into my, I, I did an interview, I think with a Russian okay. um, fanzine a few years ago. And mm -hmm. he asked me a lot of questions like you, and um, yeah. it really got me thinking about it because I hadn't thought about it for years. And then I went deep, and I looked at well, what actually happened to you? Oh my God, he's dead! What the? <laughs> I don't know if uh, I don't know if this is a show for kids. I, I just kept it clean there. I didn't That's say what I okay. really said. I, I've been censoring people with the taser sound you know, effect. What the fuck? Look at yeah. him. And yeah. they left him as a cliffhanger, and they never resolved it. <laughs> and. Um, and so it really got into my head for a while, and I think that's why to this day YouTube still recommends siphon filter stuff to me. Yeah. That's why we're talking. Yeah. Um, other than the fact that we're lifelong friends. Of course, um, best friends. But okay, so here's what I would do. First of all, from a story perspective, I am in love with this idea. You mm -hmm. know what? Gabe, when he was shot in the back and left for dead, Gabe don't die. No <laughs> bullet can kill Gabe, but like uh, like uh, Alan Moore's The Killing Joke, they severed his spine. Oh. And now he's confined to a wheelchair, and now Gabe is the guy in the van. Oh. Gabe, get John Cacone back and have him do nothing but all of the, Leon, you've got to get over and push the button really fast before the thing explodes. It would be so awesome. So that would be I, cool. I see the action being, you get to play as Leon and Teresa. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Badass couple of ladies who you know can just take anything down. Leon would probably focus more on stealth stuff. Teresa would be more action stuff, and mm -hmm. you'd have Gabe in your ear the whole time, walking you through it. And that would be amazing. And there would be a level at some point in the game where the bad guys find out where because Gabe has become Oracle from Batman, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Um, and they find him, and so we have a we have to work like crazy to make an entire level devoted to Gabe in a wheelchair fighting these guys off <laughs> and kicking ass in a wheelchair, and that would be amazing. That I would, would be so cool. love to do that. And you know, I've thought a lot about what would the controls be and stuff like that. And I, I think it could be. And nobody's ever done anything like that. It would be insane. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and, and you know, give uh, Teresa and Leon, you know, why why does it always have to be uh, buddy cops who are guys? Yeah. Um, you know, you know, let the ladies take the center stage. And oh man, if if if, if Chacon still has the pipes, I just yeah. want to hear him talk all day long. Um, and um, one thing that's good about that is that they're characters that have been around since the first game. So it's not like jarring, like, here's the new Siphon Filter. It's all girls now. Unlike it's Siphon all... Filter Omega Strain that introduced you to like a whole new cast. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd want to give nods to you know that cast to bring back Stone and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, obviously, this would be going back to basics. And yeah. from a gameplay perspective, you know, I, again, I, I wouldn't just want to make it feel like every other third-person run-and-gun shooter that's out there because yeah. everybody's done it. And you know, I, I want to go back to I mean, one thing, you know, and watching your videos has reminded me all too well mm -hmm. that um, I failed at my goal. My goal originally with Siphon Filter was, you know what, you don't have a flak jacket. A couple of bullets and you die. Just oh. like real life. Ultimately, Rainbow Six did that. I remember I seeing that at Rainbow, and I was like, oh my god, your guys are so awesome. Um, mm. And that's when we came up with, well, we'll say your flak jacket is your life meter, and that's why it kind of covers up, and once it's gone. But um, the reason I wanted to do that is because I just wanted to train players to always be moving. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, just, and that's how you stay alive. And I think Gears of War is so influential, just so mm -hmm. insanely influential that everybody, I mean, we were copying Gears of War before it came out because we let you peek around <laughs> corners and stuff like that. Yeah. And I want to get away from that. And so I would want to see a game that really pushes enemy AI, that mm -hmm. they do feel like, look, I'm fighting against a bunch of human beings who are smart enough to not just stand out in the open and wait for a guy to peek out, shoot them in the head and peep back. You know, yeah. if you're doing that, they will flank you, and they will, um, and you will know it because Gabe is shouting at you in your ear the whole time. Jesus fucking Christ, they're flanking you! Move, move, move! <laughs> and um, and so, originally, I mean, here's a, I can't believe I was so stupid. Why did I put the target meter and the danger meter up in the top left corner of the screen where you never see it, even though we yeah. flash it red? And it's so important because you're supposed to be able to use that. I know how long I'm safe when it's flashing. Now I've got to get into hiding. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, was it Call of Duty do, and, and, and Rainbow Six does the brilliant thing of, hey, let's just make the reticle get bigger and smaller and let you know how much danger you're in. It's like, that's brilliant. Yeah. And um, so I like those ideas. But I want AI that's smart enough to flank you and force you. Like you are fighting against you know twenty people who are real human beings and not just you know target dummies. Yeah. And I want you to know 
but in a new way. I, I don't want to. And so I like the idea of, oh, it's it's modern day. There's a little bit of tech out there. So if um, I, I think it could be really visually arresting if mm. maybe because I've got augmented reality because it's the 20s now. Yeah. Sure, all grand reality is that um, when you're running around, you actually see basically for every single bad guy a uh, laser light. Even though they don't necessarily have laser lights on them, the yeah. automated reality lets you see the exact trajectory they're firing at. So you oh, know cool. if you're going to be hit because you see, you know, it's it's such a common thing in the movies. That moment when the guy comes through the door and then all the lights pin on him. Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm dead. You know? Yeah. I want to make a game out of that where, you know, That'd those cool. are an in-world user interface, a GUI, that lets you know without having to look at a little mini-map or look at meters or look at reticles, you can mm -hmm. see, fuck, if I don't move now, the next bullet is going to hit me. Yeah. And I think that would be very, very cool. I don't think anybody has done anything quite like that. And then uh, I've got some ideas for how controls work because I yeah. still like target locking. You don't need target locking at all anymore. Obviously, no. everybody does dual, everybody's trained to use dual thumbsticks now. Yeah. But, oops, I just lost my mic. I'm so excited. Um... <laughs> But I, 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 I have some ideas for how to actually do the controls as well. Because for me, every game I ever designed always started with, okay, what are the controls like? Because everything comes out of that. So <laughs> I will not bore you because I'm really getting too much in the weeds. But <laughs> yeah, I went for like a few weeks. Just I could not stop thinking about it. And I'd go to yeah. bed and then I'd just wake up in the middle. Oh, wait, I got to write that down. So I, I like that idea. Yeah, um, I've got it in me. But I don't know what Sony's doing with it. I mean, well, hey, Days Gone is basically Siphon Filter X. That was what I was going to ask. So what do you think about Days Gone being possibly in the Siphon Filter universe? There's no possibly about it. You find the documents. That That's show right. That's right. That, yeah. I mean, you, you, if you go and you you know follow all the Easter eggs and you yep. read all the files in game, you see, oh, yeah, look, here's this talk about this agent named Gabe Logan. And they yeah. were chasing down this Siphon Filter virus. And he died. And, and you get a teaser. You know? and a, apparently uh, and there's a here's motor the world we're in. Yeah, apparently there's a motorcycle called Siphon Filter or something in it. Someone tweeted oh, that to me. Oh, I didn't know that. I just knew that they put the taser in and really yeah, kind yeah. of... Oh, it's interesting. I mean, it's really cool the way they've implemented yeah. the taser, but yeah. it loses, I think, some of its kind of silly charm that the old one had. I think it needs the camera to cut and exactly. have the guy yeah, stay yeah. still. Like, when, Although I do like that you could tase a bear. That's enough to get, <laughs> get to get me to buy the game. How uh, did which we I not will... have tasing bears in the original? What's wrong but, but, with me? How did I miss kinda, that? <laughs> it's kind of funny that it's possibly in the same, or it is in the same universe. Um, so how does it feel that you had this crazy idea and then you like made it more realistic and now there's zombies and bears lighting on fire <laughs> in your universe? <laughs> Well, you know what? All those people who kept saying, hey, could you put a little bit more fantastical stuff? Can you put in vampires or zombies or space missions? I guess they finally got their way. They won. It, they it, won. Yeah, it just took them 20 years. Yeah, uh, I do need to get that game. All right. Yeah, I, I really want to get that game. Uh, I think. Oh, I, yeah, I'm, it looks fantastic. I, I think they did an amazing job. Yeah, I'm playing the new uh, Doom now, which actually you were talking about, like, what, one thing I like about the new Doom games, I don't know if you've played them, yeah, you, there's not a lot of oh, I'm gonna sneak behind this wall and shoot. Like those enemies are after you. They are constantly trying to yes. run in your face and murder you. Somebody finally got it. I don't know why yeah. it took so long to get back. And, I mean, look, look, the I most important Gears thing about the original Doom was yeah. you could literally dodge the bullets. Yeah. Those fireballs they moved slow, and the whole point was to get out of the way. Yeah, and you know everybody forgets that in the world of hit scan, where you know okay, yeah. bullets are just probabilistic whether they hit you or not, and yeah. so yeah. I don't know where all that weird platforming comes from, but that aside, yeah. I think that team definitely got the idea, yeah, which and took look, a long time. I, I love Gears of War. I really like Gears of War. I just don't think every game needed <laughs> the same kind of shooting as Gears of War. Yeah, yeah. It's like, look, not everything needs this. It's fine. It's fine for these characters who are super bulky and not very <laughs> agile to yeah. have to keep ducking and shooting, but then you play like, I know I'm Uncharted a lot, like there's this super agile guy, but he's constantly ducking and peeking yep. around walls to shoot, yep. and it doesn't make any sense. And it's amazing, you know, they they did it amazingly, but yeah, it's it is still just kind of a retread. Yeah, of, I mean, you know, Gears of War is so insanely, yeah, um, yeah, influential. Yeah. Um, so this next question is very important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So save the best for last. Well, well, not last, but this is All definitely right. this is the, the second to last. Uh, so why? Do why why do Metal Gear Solid fans suck and why are their penises small and why are they not good at talking at girls and why do they hate everything and why do they all look like Vito who's a total loser 
and uh, why are they just totally insufferable to be around? Can you answer that? Snake! <laughs> that would be my answer. Okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to ask you that. <laughs> it's uh, very important to get to the bottom. That's uh, hard-hitting journalism people yeah. have come to expect. And you know what? I never had a problem with Metal Gear. I, I played it. I didn't really like it, but I was fine if people liked it until they shit like a siphon filter. <laughs> they got so... Like, I've had friends my entire life get so defensive if I say I like siphon filter because they're such huge Metal, huge metal Gear fans. Yeah. And they act like I insulted their mother or something. So that's the only reason I've gotten super defensive because they attacked first. Anyway. <laughs> um, so the very last question. Okay. And this is this is the biggest one. Uh, so what's it like knowing that you made the greatest game of all time and no other game will ever come close and they should have stopped making video games after you made this because it was perfect. What's that like? Damn right. <laughs> I am very proud of Siphon Filter. Yeah. I, I and, and and of the team. Like I say, if you go back, I mean, it's like we had like 15 people, less than 15 mm -hmm. people as the key team on that, and we were just we had no idea what was possible. I mean, yeah. anybody would have told us anything we want to do that game. It just can't be done. And it's yeah. just we were all just running to stand still on that game. And somehow, you know, every time I would ask the programmers, "Hey, can we do this?" They would find a way. And it should have been impossible. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm. It makes me happy. the The best thing about my life making video games is mm. that I do know for a fact that I made the lives of literally millions of people, apparently yourself included. Oh yeah. Just for a few hours, just a little bit better. Oh, you know? Just a few hours. Try, uh, or, or in some years. cases, more than a few hours. Years. Many, many years. <laughs> yep. And um, yeah, and, and, and that's just such an amazing gift that mm. I was lucky enough to be able to do that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, getting a bit schmaltzy, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just so incredibly proud of it. And I'm so incredibly happy. And, and having watched your video and your insane fanboyism, yeah. um, you know, obviously, I know you're playing it up for the camera and all that, but... I mean, I, yeah. I do know. I, I, I to me, it, it feels very real and genuine. It's coming oh, it's, from a real it, place. It's real. I play yeah. it up when I'm with an asshole who doesn't like it. Uh, but yeah. no, I genuinely, it is my favorite game of all time. It always will be. Yep. Uh, I showed you a picture. I have a siphon filter shelf at my office. Yep. Uh, yeah, I still have. Um, there's a new show on Cinemasker called Retail Reviews that takes place in a game store, and I got a siphon filter two magazine. <laughs> like on the background somewhere oh awesome uh so yeah it's uh one of my it's it's my favorite game of all time it's the only like i love video games but it was the one game that actually like really just connected with me more than any other game ever has yep uh and fortunately yeah. it had that teen rating instead of a m like it should have uh, yeah i have no idea how that's <laughs> how did that happen i have no idea how we got that <laughs> with you know literally setting people on fire yeah um, and murdering what turned out to be Completely innocent scientists. John so loved that twist. They just we just kind of barely mentioned. It. Oh, by the yeah. way, all those scientists were totally innocent. You were duped into assassinating them, so so that Markinson could clean up. You cleaned up Markinson's uh, dirty work for him. How yeah, you feel, but, chump? Yeah, and that's great. I think we just briefly mentioned it in the helicopter ride. And it's like that's such a you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we clearly uh, warped you. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, I I. I saw the commercial. I begged my mom to get it for me. I rarely got new games. I was never that. I loved video games, but I was never like the kid that's like, I need it right away. <laughs> like I was like, oh yeah, I heard that game's good. I'll buy it months from now. But that was something about that game called to me, uh, which which led to me making the show, which led me to you. So everything yep. came full circle, I guess. <laughs> well, when I'm I, glad I, I missed my best. Yeah, I met I, my best friend as a result. When of all I started it. this show. The last thing I ever thought was someone from the game would actually like hit me up and say they saw <laughs> it and liked it. Uh, I'm surprised more people haven't. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's because I'm turning 51 and I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> waxing rhapsodic, looking back over my life now that I am about to die. I'm not. I'm fine. Um, I'm gonna live forever, in fact. But well, uh, um, okay. Yeah. One more bonus question. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm a little tight for money now. Uh, can you send me the uh, alternate cover for Siphon Filter 3? Do you have that? I want to sell that because oh, it's the, very the, rare. Uh, you, the, mind, the cover you mind shipping that to me? I sign it too. <laughs> yeah. Nope, that was sorry. I was already out the door at that point. But geez, <laughs> talk about, I mean, what, I mean, obviously, 
I mean, I, I, free people don't know. Siphon Filter 3, okay, yep. they worked like crazy, worked like dogs to get it done in time. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to launch like November 15th, 2001. Yep, I remember. You know, I, I remember seeing the poster in GameStop and getting super excited. Yep. And then uh, everything changed. And, yes. um, and then yes. very quietly, six months later, okay, well, let's just put this little game out where the capital is on fire. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Uh, it's uh, such an insane ride, Siphon yeah. Filter. But apparently that cover and those posters are like super rare and very Oh, I, did. I had no idea that there was an aftermarket thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I said, if you happen to have a couple, send some Tony's way. Uh, he won't, he'll, he'll thank you. You are my best friend. <laughs> it's the least I can do. I am, I am your best friend. Anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for doing this. Please check out Richard's channel. I'm obviously going to link it and all the links that he gives me. Yeah. Uh, and thank you so much for doing this. This is a dream come true. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me, too. I really, it's, yeah. it's, you know, as you get older, you you enjoy waxing nostalgic. And so yes. I appreciate that. And I really enjoyed the show. It was you and your friends were yeah. all very entertaining. Thank you. And I'm yeah. glad the one of the creators from the game got to see me talk about this. I hope one day the people involved with making the movie Roadhouse, which is the greatest movie ever made, will see the videos I've made about Roadhouse. And once again, <laughs> my everything will come full circle. But until now, this is... This is great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for watching. I'll, I'll put in a word with Swayze when I see him next. <laughs> Thank you for watching, everyone. And maybe I'll be back with Siphon Filter 2 and Friends or a different game. I don't know, but definitely something. And goodbye. Bye.